mean, who goes up on that stage? That is psychopathic. That's right. Sam, yes. let's talk about the area that Mary and other women that are alienated mothers, would they be attracted to a narcissist psychopath because they may have experienced that in their own family. I keep hearing this uh, from your perspective. Is People are not, a, these women are not attracted to a nice guy like me. They're attracted to what they grew up with in a narcissistic uh, world as a child. The narcissist is attracted to anyone who would provide him with supply. So with attention. So right. the narcissist is indiscriminate. In many, in other words, a narcissist is promiscuous, is indiscriminate. He doesn't, it's not true, it's a myth that the narcissist prefers codependence or prefers weak women or prefers strong women or prefers, he has no preference. His only preference, his only test, can you provide him with supply, is with you. You can be a narcissist, you can be a psychopath, you could be a codependent, you can be disabled, you could be a marathon runner, but if you can provide him with supply, he's with you. The other the other side, on the other side, is different. There are specific types of women who are attracted to narcissists and psychopaths. And right. these are women who suffer from a deficit of self-love. And they suffer from a deficit of self-love they, because they had never, not all of them, but as a generalization, they suffer from a deficit of self-love because they had never received unconditional love from their parents, mainly the mother, usually, but not only. And so they were unable to develop a view of themselves as lovable. They don't. And so here comes the narcissist and he creates this idealized image of the woman. And the woman falls in love with her idealized image. The woman but it's fake though. Sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. The narcissist world is fake. It's not real though, because it becomes evil after uh, the narcissist uh, psychopath takes off his mask. And then you realize it's not real unconditional love. You don't, these women don't love the narcissist. They don't love the psychopath. They love the way the narcissist sees them. Uh, okay. they, love, they love the way the narcissist idealizes them. This is called love bombing or grooming. They, they, they fall in love with themselves through the eyes of the narcissist. They, it, it is the first time these women experience self-love. They had never experienced self-love, and here comes the narcissist, and right. he offers them he offers them a Faustian deal, a deal with the devil. He says, "Listen, <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna make yes. you I'm gonna make you experience self-love. I'm gonna make you feel lovable for the first time in your life. I'm gonna give you the unconditional love that your mother hadn't given you, that your father hadn't given you. I'm gonna give you this unconditional love, and I'm gonna regard you in terms of a divinity, of a deity." You're, in my eyes, you're perfect, you're amazing, you're unprecedented, you're intelligent, you're brilliant, you are, you are, you know, and, but the, the only condition I have is that you will allow me to treat you any which way I choose. Right, they, you're an idiot, and then there's the evil side of it too, that uh, yeah. people, the women don't realize that's part of what you just said is part of the deal. After 27 years of extreme they, abuse, I finally met someone and uh, fell in love. So I experienced love with a narcissist. And I, like Sam says, you fall in love with yourself. I mean, that's the first time I ever noticed myself looking in the mirror and I said, who's that girl? You know, like, wow, that's me. I've never seen that. I'm, I was 60 years old when I finally noticed who I was because being put down by a, a, a psychopath all those years, you, I lost my identity, but I was still me. I still took care of everybody, but mentally I didn't think I was worthy. So yes, I could understand, you know, for 27 years, my mind was playing games on me. And then for 27 months, I got to feel what it was like to be a woman. But then at the end of that, he ended up, he had a wife. So narcissistic supply, that's what I was. And I thought, whoa, scary. But I ended it for 15 months, no contact, like Sam always says, no contact, no contact. Right, Sam? But Sam, you're exactly right. There is that promiscuous trait of a narcissist psychopath 
with just what Mary just mentioned, the guy was married and he still hit on Mary and wanted his supply. Yeah, it's very simple. If she can provide it, it's like, it's, you can easily compare it to substance abuse. Mary is, Mary is the pusher because she can provide him with the drug of his choice and the drug of his choice is attention, simple. So he's a junkie, he's a junkie and junkies have no, junkies have no morals. A junkie would steal from his own mother. A junkie Absolutely. would sell his daughter. You know, he would do anything for the drug. The same with the narcissist. And coming, there's a point, I think, which might be of interest to your listeners, if I may, interject. Right, go ahead. And that's how narcissists and psychopaths view their children. Because I think it ties in with the parental alienation concept, you know. That was my next question. So narcissists and psychopaths see their children in four ways. Um, as competition, and, and I'll elaborate a bit with your permission, I'll elaborate on, on each of these. As competition, as nuisance, as a source of supply, and as pawns, as, as instruments or tools in the battle with the spouse or with the, with the intimate partner or with the significant other. Yeah? So let, let's, let's elaborate two sentences on each one of these. So as competition, the narcissist that's typical of narcissists, not of psychopaths. Narcissists yeah. regard children as competition because children compete for attention. Children compete for the time and resources of the, of the intimate partner, of the spouse, of the mother. Yeah? So narcissists begin to regard the children as competing with him for scarce resources. And he, regards, he begins to regard the children as enemies. That's the first thing. And then narcissists abuse children and so on. But precisely because of this, they hate children. A narcissist is a child. It's a person whose growth and personal development had been stunted in early childhood and never, never grew up. It's a Peter Pan. He's two years old. He's three years old. He easily competes wow. with, tod with yeah. toddlers, you know. Right. Second, second thing is a nuisance. So the narcissist regards children as encroaching on his time, on his freedom, on his liberty. And encumbering him with obligations and responsibilities, duties and chores, which narcissists detest. So children become a nuisance and narcissists can become very aggressive toward children in trying to neutralize the nuisance value of children. The third thing is sources of supply. As the, as the children grow up a bit, when they become like adolescents, anywhere between ages two, 10 and eight, 18, they become sources of narcissistic supply. They begin, to, they begin to adulate the father, to, to emulate the father, to idolize the father, to give the father attention. I'm saying father because, um, but, but it's, it's equally applicable to narcissistic mothers, yes? So at that point, the children suddenly are no longer a nuisance. They're no longer a competition. They're sources of supply. You pee and the narcissist is all over them and he appropriates them. And he renders them, he converts them into extensions of himself. He, they, 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 he, he begins to treat them not as independent personalities or individuals, but as extensions. So he doesn't allow them to separate and to become individuals. He kind of hems them in. He, he suffocates them. He, right. and, they, and they can't recover from that. No, they People, can't. The alienating them. parent is always hoping, oh, maybe when they become 18, they'll come and realize what's happened. There's no point of return from this. Am I correct? The, damage, the damage is lifelong, yes. And then the fourth, which leads, which leads to the fourth point. The fourth point, and the fourth point is typical of psychopaths. The first three, these, these are narcissists. The fourth point is a psychopath. The psychopath regards children as a tool or an instrument or a weapon, actually. He weaponizes right. children. He wep or she yeah, weaponize, weaponizes children to induce, um, to induce damage, to inflict damage and induce pain in the, the person who had frustrated him, which happens to be the spouse, the ex-spouse or, right. the, or the intimate partner or whatever. So the children <laughs> yeah. become weaponized. That, that's the psychopathic thing usually. And that's deliberate. The psychopath knows what he's doing there. Absolutely, yes. It's a strategy. It's a strategy. Yeah. There's long-term planning and deliberation which go into it. There, there is brainwashing. It's a process called entraining, by the way. I encourage you, encourage you to watch 
my recent dialogue with Richard Grannon on the topic of entraining. So the psychopath brainwashes the children and trains them and, and converts them into weapons, guided missiles. They become guided missiles, absolutely, cruise missiles, uh, aimed exclusively at the intimate partner. So parental alienation is real. Right. Although parental alienation syndrome is contested. I'm a professor of psychology and I'm taught, I'm told to not teach it because it's wrong. But the phenomenon of parental alienation is real. It's may, it may not be a syndrome, but there are parents who deliberately, intentionally, with forethought and malice, turn children against the spouse, against the, the former partner. This is a well-documented phenomenon. Well, you're a professor of psychology from a psychological perspective. How does this happen uh, in uh, their desire to turn against the other parent? Is this something that uh, they're, you mentioned they're like um, ch ch children, their brain hasn't developed? Is it mental illness? Because the normal person wouldn't think that way. There are two two aspects to your question. There's the question of why, why does the parent do that, the psychopathic parent or narcissistic parent, why, why do they do that? And then there's the question of why does the child do that? Right. Because, because, because the child does become a weapon. The child, for example, develops extreme aversion to the other parent. The child begins to attack the other parent indiscriminately. The child refuses to listen to countervailing ad arguments and facts. The child inhabits a fantastic space generated by the alienating parent. And within this fantastic space, the child refuses to exit this space or consider any alternatives. So there is a tacit collaboration between the child and the alienating parent. And we should ask ourselves why? Because some of the children are not that young. You know, some of them are 15 and 16 and they're capable of critical thinking. And yet yeah. they suspend it. So there are two... Two very important, I think, perspectives or angles, if I may. The alienating parent is usually a narcissist or a psychopath who has suffered an injury, a mental injury, narcissistic injury, or, right. and they never forgive. They hold a grudge. They have narcissistic rage. They want to absolutely eradicate, eliminate, and if possibly execute the source of injury, the, the, the source of the frustration, they consider themselves godlike. And any challenge to their grandiosity is perceived to be in, as inexcusable, unforgettable, and unforgivable, and worthy of the most extreme punishment, disproportionate punishment. And children are the perfect way to inflict the ultimate pain on a parent. And so weaponizing the children it's a perfect strategy. So it has to do with narcissistic injury and the classic reaction known as narcissistic rage. With the psychopath, it's more goal oriented. The psychopath usually wants something from the other, from the parent, from the other, from the co-parent. So the narcissist would say, okay, I'm going to turn the children against you unless you sign off our common property to me. Or I'm going to ch turn the children against you unless you have sex with me. So the psychopath is much more goal-oriented. The narcissist is not goal-oriented. There's no way to bargain with the narcissist, to placate the narcissist, to make him forgive whatever imaginary infringement. The narcissist is hell-bent on destroying you because you had caused him injury and he's in a state of unbridled rage. So this is, this is, this is the parental side. Now, what, what about the child? Why does a child collude and collaborate in this? Because the child is in pain. The child is in pain and the, child, the child's world, in the case of divorce, the child's world has disintegrated and has been rendered meaningless. The child seeks meaning. The, the, child needs to, the child needs to make sense of what had happened. And so the only way to make sense of what had happened is a morality play where one of the parents is the devil and the other parent is the angel. So now everything makes sense. Suddenly the world is again meaningful. Suddenly everything is imbued with sense, direction, meaning, and everything falls into place and justice can be restored 
by punishing the demonic parent somehow. So it's a morality play. We call this splitting. It's a right. splitting defense. Splitting defense mechanism means that you, what we call dichotomous thinking. Everything bad, everything good. Someone is all bad, someone is all good. Someone is white, someone is black. So the child says, this parent is all bad, all black, all, all, all wrong. This parent is all good, all white, all true. And this is called splitting. It's very common in adolescence because adolescents are narcissists, actually. The period of adolescence involves a very heightened degree of narcissism. So these are narcissists, in fact. And narcissists engage in splitting habitually. So it's very yeah. easy to turn a child against a parent by leveraging the child's narcissism and encouraging, fostering and egging on the splitting defense. And then the child says, oh my God, now I understand everything. Now I understand everything that happened. My father is the devil. He is demonic. He is evil. He is corrupt. He's a horrible person. And my mother is the ultimate victim, or vice versa, doesn't matter. Is the ultimate victim. And now all falls into place. And I can rest in peace, so to speak, or at least sleep peacefully. Because I can wake up in the morning and I know whose side I should be on, the side of the good and the angels. May I You're comment? Uh, Let me hold comment. on, hold on, hold on, Mary. You're watching the Andy Martin Show. We're in a special presentation uh, tonight with Sam Mackinnon. Mary Kovacs is along and uh, in our remaining moments. So, all right, Mary, go ahead. Uh, Sam, I just want you to know that um, I married an alienated child. He was alienated at nine months, never to see a father again. So his mom remarried at 14. After 14, he was discarded in the family. And he went on to becoming a really serious bully. But anyways, um, at 25, we found his father. But um, all he heard was that his father was a monster growing up. And when we found his father, two months before we were to meet him, was murdered. After that, I was severely punished for bringing him false hope, bringing his father to, to light, you know, like bringing him to his mind and stuff. So for punishment, he did the exact same thing. He turned around. I knew every, every move an alienator would do to keep the family, his, his, he would, you know, wouldn't even let me answer the door for his pair, his mom and his new stepfather. So, you know, dealing with a alienated child, adult child is so dangerous. Um, mentally, emotionally, and psychologically, they mess you up because you get blamed for everything their mother did or whoever the alienating parent is. So I highly recommend that uh, parent alienation be uh, more, more, um, open out to the world, to the courts, to everyone to understand that they're psychologically abusing young children to grow to be psychopaths. Right. The problem, the problem, Mary, is a lot of people, and I've seen it for the year and a half we've been doing shows on parental alienation. The problem is most people are like, oh, it doesn't it doesn't concern me, so I'm not interested in this if I'm not affected by it. You know, all the opioid deaths worldwide, well, it doesn't concern me. It's a social issue. But I wanted to ask Sam about... But it about, will eventually. It, it will eventually when the family should hit. Right. Around. We've got, we've got a lot of work to do to get it there. Yes. But I wanted to ask Sam about this. The narcissist psychopath hates a demonic, like you mentioned, but this... So, you know, um, the alienating parent is the one that's fooled all the way along because if the narcissist or psychopath can do this, alienate the children from the mother or the father, vice versa, that person never loved the person that they had children with in the beginning. Am I right, Sam? There was no love or empathy there from the beginning on this process. Love, love and hate in psychology, at least, in the science of psychology, are flip, flip sides of the same coin. We call this ambivalence. It's very easy to transition from love to hate. 
And um, given enough frustration and, and anger, people do transition from love to hate. However, I agree with you. I agree yeah. with you that this alienating parents or parents who resort to such strategies, especially the ones who do so deliberately and intentionally, are people who are incapable of true love. They're incapable of true love. They misinterpret other emotions and other behaviors as love. For example, they misinterpret dependency as love. They mis right. misinterpret manipulation as love. They misinterpret emotional blackmail as love. They sometimes misinterpret mere presence as love. Just being there is kind of love. So they don't understand love. They've never experienced love. They are love challenged, definitely. I would like to respond to something uh, Mary had said, actually. Okay. Um, children who are alienated get emotionally invested in the alienating narrative. The alienating narrative, the narrative offered by the alienating parent, helps them to make sense of the world, reduces their anxiety, and allows them to function. So children get invested in this narrative. This process is called cathexis. They get cathected in the narrative. Later on in life, it's a struggle to get a more, to obtain a more balanced view, to hear the other side, to talk to the, to the other parent. The child is already enmeshed and embedded and invested in the narrative. That's the first thing. The second thing is that children with parents who have gone through a process of alienation would tend, would try very hard to find a substitute set of parents. Because who wants to have two parents who are at conflict? Who wants to have two parents who keep fighting with each other, hate each other's guts, turn, yeah. turn you against each other? And no one wants such parents. So these people go through life later on when they grow up, they go through life looking for substitute parents, surrogate parents. So if it's, a, if it's a boy, the boy will grow up and as an adult, he will be looking for a mummy. He will never be able to have adult relationships. He will try to convert his intimate partner into a mother figure, a maternal figure, and vice versa for a girl. She will try, she will have daddy issues because they will be focused not on having full-fledged, mature adult relationships. They will be focused on healing their internal wounds by mm. finding substitute mother or substitute father. That's the second thing. And the third thing is, whatever is done to you as a child, you're going to do to others when you're an adult. The narcissist was not allowed to develop boundaries as a child. People become narcissists because as children, they were not allowed to separate from mommy. Mommy didn't allow them to become individuals. Mommy okay. was selfish or overbearing or depressive or absent, or we call it the dead mother, not good enough mother. So these narcissists were not allowed as children to separate and individuate, become separate individuals. So when they team up with an intimate partner later in life, they don't allow her to separate and become an individual. Whatever is done to you as a child, you're going to do in the future to others. That so will if, you're alienated, if you're alienated as a child, you're going to reenact these right. dynamics in your own family. Right. Absolutely. That, that'll come from the form of control, isn't it, Sam? Control, you will control the person and not allow them to be an individual. Yes, yeah. you, you would try to assimilate the person, to merge with the person, to fuse with the person. We call it symbiosis. You will try to assimilate the person to make that person disappear. Because if the, if the person in your life, if your intimate partner is an independent, autonomous entity, she can walk out on you. She can abandon you the same way your mother had done. You don't want this to happen. So you want to convert her into an avatar a representation, an inner internal object, an image, a symbol, not a real person. And whenever she shows any sign that she is a real person of being a real person, you're going to repress her and punish her. 
because yeah. you should not be a real person because it threatens you. So, yeah. so it's it's what uh, people, uh, uh, parents who alienate children, who turn them against the other parent, they're damaging these children for life because these children are going to reenact this family, these family dynamics in their own family later on. It's inevitable. It's inevitable. So what's your out outlook on... Mary, on uh, Mary you're... Uh, we got children to onto the stand. Sam, I'm sorry, you were, you were cross-talking and I... Oh, okay. Hear. Mary, uh, we got to watch our time here. Otherwise, okay. we're not going to be able to upload it on our show okay. tonight. So. Just one quick question. Tomorrow, when the children get put on the stand, will that damage them even more? The adult children. Yes, of course. Uh, forcing the child to take a stance or to adopt one of the parents as, as the preferred parent and so on and so forth is compounds the damage. Compounds the damage. Can, but they Can they suffer psychosis or anything? Not psychosis. Psychosis is very extreme. And, but they, can, they are damaged in, in attachment. Their attachment capabilities are damaged. They develop insecure attachment styles and then they undermine their own sabotage, their own relationships. Because they try to force the family, the, the dynamic of the family of origin onto the family they are creating. And they ruin everything time and again. It's, we call it repetition compulsion. They keep repeating the same pattern yeah. over and over. And even if they are aware that they are making these mistakes, they can't help themselves. It's compulsive. Oh. It's who they There's are. No when you Is alienate the child, it's who the child is. You're not just affecting behavior or trait. You're changing the child, you're transforming the child. And yes, of course, there's help. I mean, therapy. But why should your child go to therapy for the rest of his life? It's a horrible thing to do to your child. You know. Well, I have been forty-four years. I've been going to therapy. Yeah, well, is that is that recommended? Is that is that what you want for your child to to attend no, therapy for forty-four years? Not. But it, it just keeps reoccurring. I don't go daily. It's just, you know, year after year, something you, happens. You, you, also, you, you also, I don't know you well, but you, you also sound to me like you keep repeating the same dysfunctional patterns in your relationships. And I'm sure that you had been conditioned to do so. Two. I only had two. Okay, well, two is a problem. You repeated it, Mary. Sam's right. You were with the narcissist the second time around, too. Yeah, well, there's no third. You know, 27 years for one, 27 months never say, for another. Never say never. James, James Bond, never say never. <laughs> but Sam, uh, Sam, you are a self-progressed narcissist. Were you evil and demonic at one point in your life? Yes. As you say, you were. What made oh, you sure. reverse course from that? Pri prison. Prison. Oh, made me reverse okay. course. I, I went to prison. And then when I exited prison, I said no more because I'd lost everything. I was a very, 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 very rich guy. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. Rich. So I lost all my, all my money. I lost my wife. I didn't have a family like I didn't have children, but I lost my wife, my, my money, all my money, my reputation. I was very, very well known in Israel. And so I lost my right. reputation and everything. I said, no more. I've hit rock bottom. I said, no more. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to study what's wrong with me. And then I'm going to teach the rest of the world. And I was the first ever in 1995 to describe the phenomenon of pathological narcissism online. And I coined the phrase narcissistic abuse. And then I taught many generations for nine, nine years. I had the only website on narcissistic abuse anywhere. And I had the only support. I <laughs> so I taught, I taught generations of people about, and then they carried it on. And so this is all my, my brainchild. It's not because I wanted to atone um, I'm not pretending. I didn't want to atone or anything, but it wasn't working for me. I said, narcissism is a seriously bad strategy, you know? It sucks. I'm not going to do this right. again. And right. so I, I, I chose to obtain supply, attention, and so on in socially acceptable ways and by helping others. I think that's a solution for narcissism, to teach them to obtain supply because they can't be remedied. They can't be cured. They can't be healed. It's too late. For, narcissist is someone who has been seriously damaged in childhood. So, but you can redirect narcissism, make it a force for good. Redirect That's this energy. Do. I'm proof, I'm living proof of this. I've redirected my seriously negative energy and I've rendered it seriously positive. I've transformed the lives of millions. Why not? Every narcissist can do this. 
you know? Yeah. Now narcissists need to hit rock bottom, I think, yeah. like yeah. you do in Psychopath. Yeah. Because otherwise, if times are good, then it's not going to happen. Very true. Yes, as, Unfor as that's an unfortunate, an but it's true. As an empath, I hit rock bottom, too. I was falsely arrested, went to prison twice. I lost everything, everything, including my children. I am here today, 16 years later, advocating to yeah. prevent people from falling into the same situation. So I teach people what you teach people, but I teach them in an empathetic way. So, you know, yeah. Um, yeah. there's hope for us. Yeah, I there's think I think, I think all in all, yes. I think there's hope for, for personal transformation. People say prison is a bad idea because you go in innocent, you come out a criminal. Not yeah, always, not, really. not always. No. I think no. if you go on, you go in with a criminal mindset, you'll come out uh, a worse criminal than you had been. Yeah. But if you go in with a different mindset and you let prison do its work, it can be transformative. I'm living. And that's what happened. Yes, that's so true. I went in as an innocent person, came out fighting even twice the innocent. Yeah. So how long were you? In, so much, Sam. How long were you in prison for, Sam? Just a year, but. It was a crucial year. During this year, I'd written Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited, which is right. the first textbook ever on narcissistic abuse. I'd written many other books in prison. I'd written a total of seven. One of them, short fiction, was published and won Israel's number one literary prize. So this year has been productive, transformative. Prison is the best thing that had ever happened to me, honestly. Me too. Me the too. Best. Absolutely. <laughs> best. And I'm innocent. But I wrote a book, too. It'll be out in the spring, uh, Journey of Love. I'm going to send you a copy, Sam, when it's uh, when I get my book Pleasure. released, when they Andy. And i um, so grateful that you're here today. All Thank right. you so much. For Thank you, time. Sam. Yeah. Thank you. We Thank are, you for uh, one final question. Yes, we are running out of time. One final question. What is the narcissist then? psychopath I, I see that in my family why do they need to alienate their own family in the sense that a brother will alienate his sister's children why do it in the family type of thing they don't make any distinctions between family or not family they have no emotional attachments to anyone to anybody they, yeah yeah <laughs> they alienate because it's a many manipulative techniques uh, technique divide yeah. and rule or they want to obtain some goal or they want to obtain attention drama queens you know they create drama so they are self-focused to the exclusion of all others and that you happen to be family it's your bad luck <laughs> it's nothing to do with them and you know? they alienate your whole family they won't call you there's no contact they won't they hold you in contempt in any case narcissists <laughs> and psychopaths hold everyone in contempt you're inferior by definition so they consent right. they condescend to talk to you, you know, sometimes grandparents oh. grand yeah grandparents cousins uncles my mother hasn't seen my children just as long as me. So it's a pandemic. Uh, it's like the virus. The virus doesn't make any allowances. You know, it's a pandemic. It's a virus. It's a mental that's virus. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. Yes, and we are we living. Gotta, through. We gotta go, Mary. Our time is up. Thank you. My so wife. My Andy. wife is 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 up right. also. So good time. We've been watching the Andy Martin show with Mary Kovacs and Sam Mackinnon, professor of psychology and an expert. Uh, narcissism, psychopaths, and we'll invite you back again, Sam. Thanks Thank so you. much for Thank being here. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, take care, both Thank of you. you. Take care. Bye. Okay. Take care. Bye -bye. I'm going to send you Bye. the recorded file. Okay. Thank great. you. Bye.